quite young yet, is he? Простите, технические сложности. Who seek peace. Ambassador, Tempo, we cannot hear you. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now we can hear you. Just now. Okay. Okay. Ambassador Christopher Hill was the 2021. Christopher Hill. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So shall shall I start over? Maybe. Okay, good morning, good afternoon. Доброе утро, добрый день. Добрый день. Buenos dias. Bon dia. Bon dia. On the issue of the reunification of the Korean Peninsula. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce the uh, Ambassador Christopher, Christopher Hill, who will be moderating this session. I'd like to make one point that Universal Peace Federation uh, facilitates dialogue and brings together leading figures in every area to discuss the issue of peace from different perspectives. Ambassador Hill, who will moderate the session, was the 2021 Charles W. Ball Prof Professor of the Practice of Diplomacy in the Columbia University School of International Public Affairs. He is a career di diplomat, a four-time ambassador appointed by three presidents, ambassador to Macedonia, Poland, Korea, and most recently to Iraq. Prior to Iraq, Hill served as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs from 2005 until 2009, during which he, has, he was also head of the U.S. delegation to the six-party talks on the North Korean nuclear issue. He has also served as a special assistant to the president and a senior director on the staff of the National Security Council. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Christopher Hill. Thank you very much. And thank you for, for that very generous uh, introduction. Uh, this is the uh, first session of this, uh, of this uh, global forum. And I think it's an important session because we're really going right to the heart of the problem, which of course is the, uh, the failure so far to be able to bring uh, North Korea into the sort of, uh, into the overall international community and in particular, the failure so far to achieve peaceful uh, reunification. As I think many of you know, there's been a very, uh, we've gone through some very difficult weeks in the beginning of 2022. North Korea has engaged in uh, a number of uh, tests of, uh, of its uh, rocket and missile systems, including mobile launches, including uh, the use of uh, solid fuel rockets. So there is uh, much to be concerned about in terms of peace and stability on the uh, Korean Peninsula. But, rather, but since just worrying about a problem is not a solution, I think what we have today is a very distinguished panel of international experts who can perhaps bring their experience, their expertise, and their, their knowledge and their uh, just raw intelligence in terms of how to try to deal with this very difficult problem that uh, is kind of left over from the middle of the 20th century and uh, shows no sign of abetting here in the 21st century. 
So I'm now going to introduce our six panelists, and then I'm going to go back to the first panel, uh, to the first panelist that is first presenter, and and ask him to uh, to uh, give uh, give his thoughts on where we go from here. Needless to say, I've I've gone through a little of the background, but what we're looking for in this panel, of course is how to uh, address this in the future, because I think any anyone who looks at diplomacy looks to make progress in the future. Uh, the first person I would like to introduce, a very distinguished uh, uh, presenter, and that is the Right Honorable Stephen Harper, who served as Canada's 22nd Prime Minister from 2006 to 2015. Today, he serves as the Chairman and CEO of Harper Associates Consulting, in 2004, he co-founded the Modern Conservative Party of Canada and is a strong advocate for free trade and open markets. Under his leadership, he oversaw historic trade negotiations to expand Canada's commercial relationships, including the conclusion of the Can Canadian-European Trade Agreement and the Canadian-Korean uh, Free Trade Agreement. He implemented very clear and principled foreign policy in addition to his commercial work. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Harper is currently serves as the chairman of the International Democratic Union. He resides in Calgary, Canada, and he and his wife, Lorraine, have two children, Benjamin and Rachel. So thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Harper, for attending. And uh, I think I will introduce all the participants right now, and then I will come back to Mr. Harper to uh, do his presentation. The second uh, uh, presenter is the Honorable Kiel Magne bon, uh, Bondevik. Um, he was uh, from Norway. Uh, he is the founder and executive chair of the, of the Oslo Center. Mr. Bondevik was elected prime minister of Norway in 1997 and appointed prime minister again in 2001, serving until 2005. Mr. Bondevik was a member of parliament from 1973 to 2005 and served as a minister of church and education in, in Kari Wilcox uh, government from 1983 to 1986. He was also Minister of Foreign Affairs during the government of Jan P. Seiss in 1989 to 1990. Mr. Bondovic studied at the Norwegian Lutheran School of Theology and is an ordained pastor in the, in the Lutheran Norwegian uh, uh, State Church. We will very much look forward to his remarks. Uh, the third presenter is uh, uh, the, was the fifth president of Trinidad and Tobago. His Excellency Anthony Thomas Aquinas Carmona. Uh, he was the fifth president from uh, Trinidad and Tobago from 2013 to 2019. He was also a, a high court judge of the Supreme Court of Trinidad and Tobago. And he also served as judge of the International uh, Criminal, Criminal Courts. He will be our third presenter. And then I will turn to the category of, uh, of panelists and our, our, our first uh, panelist will be uh, Mr. Doug Bandow, Bondow, who has a background in economics and law, senior fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington, specializing in foreign policy and, and uh, civil liberties, worked as a special assistant to President Ronald Reagan and editor of the political magazine Inquiry. He writes regularly for leading publications such as Fortune Magazine, Wall Street Journal, uh, Washington Times, as well as the Foreign Policy Time, Newsweek, and the New York Times, and winner of the 19 of the prestigious 1989 Mencken Award for Best Editorial or, uh, or Op-Ed Columnist. He speaks frequently on academic conferences, on college campuses, and to business groups, and he's a regular commentator on ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC. We'd like to welcome Mr. Bandow, who will be our first uh, uh, first panelist. Uh, the next, uh, the next uh, panelist will be Mr. Salvador Nasrallah, uh, Honduran uh, television host and politician, and politician, 40 years career on TV as a host and recent forays into politics, founder of his own political party, recently elected vice president of the Republic. He took part as speaker in the summit in Dominican Republic in 2020 and uh, speaker at the World Summit in Korea. And finally, um, I'd like to introduce Mr. Niklas Swanstrom. He's director of the Institute for Security and Development Policy, one of its co-founders. He was a fellow at the Foreign uh, Policy Institute of the Paul Nitze School of Advanced International Studies at SAIS, 
also Senior Associate Fellow at the Italian Institute for International Political Studies and Guest Lecturer at the University of Pavia. Dr. Swanstrom has worked on and been a frequent traveler to North Korea since the early 90s. So with those introductions, and, and forgive me for taking time uh, with these introductions, but these are all very distinguished panelists and uh, presenters, and I thought you, you all should see, should hear uh, uh, the, their distingu distinguished accomplishments and why we've invited them to give their thoughts on where we go from here. So let me now turn to our first presenter, the Right Honorable Stephen Harper for his uh, presentation. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Hill. Uh, greetings to my fellow panelists and presenters and to the audience joining us from around, around the world. I'm honored to be here once again with the Universal Peace Federation on this occasion, Think Tank 2022, this global dialogue to promote the peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula. I congratulate the UPF for again assembling a renowned group of global speakers and experts and for tackling this subject through the seven peace associations representing the political, business, spiritual, media, academic, cultural, and women's perspectives. At a time when Russia is threatening Ukraine and China is threatening Taiwan, it's too easy to lose sight of the ongoing challenges on the Korean Peninsula. But as North Korea engages in yet another round of missile tests and South Korea witnesses a bare knuckles national election campaign, we're reminded that this issue is always worthy of attention. And not just because of actions within the Koreas, but because this issue uniquely engages many of the world's key players. In Korea's immediate neighborhood are of course, two of Asia's greatest powers, China and Japan, and two other major global powers are just as close. Russia, which sits on the border to the North and America, whose forces remain present in the South. So as long as Korean division and hostility endure, the wider piece of the world will also be in question. So how to address this? If you'll allow me, I'll summarize my thoughts around the six points I've used on a number of occasions in the past. First on South Korea, all Koreans know in their hearts, something that much of the international community does not want to admit that true peace on the Korean peninsula will mean the end of the North Korean state. Why? Because Korea is one nation. And if given the choice, Koreans will choose a society like the South because the Republic of Korea is the society, is the society that free Koreans have already chosen. But this is all the more reason, as I've said before, for South Koreans, you as South Koreans, to have peace in your hearts. Even if North Korea does not want peace, even if peace is unlikely, peace is what free Koreans want and what all free peoples want. So never give up on it. In this regard, I commend President Moon for using his time in office to pursue a peace treaty with Kim Jong-un, even if, as I expect, he will ultimately be unsuccessful in that effort. Second on North Korea, the peace South Koreans must have in their hearts must be matched by deep caution in your heads when it comes to North Korea. Even after round after round of peace and nuclear disarmament efforts, North Korea's dangerous weapons development continues. How should South Korea and the world react? Do not be provoked but be certain that the South and its allies have sufficient defenses and countermeasures against any possible attack from the North. Just as peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula must occur, a reunification by invasion must never be allowed to happen. Third, when it comes to the wider international community, it's critical to understand the role of the People's Republic of China in this conflict and to hold it accountable. Now the Chinese will claim that their control over the North and the Kim family is limited. But from the Korean War forward, 
the PRC support has been critical to their endurance. Ask yourself, if the DPRK ever threatened the PRC in the way it threatens its other neighbors, how long would it really survive? Fourth, minimize the involvement of Vladimir Putin and his Russian Federation in any dialogue. Putin's Russia may be a global power, but only in the sense of being a powerful destabilizer in the world. Putin's Russia is a disruptor, a hacker, and a mercenary, and it's unlikely to ever be a positive contributor to the evolution of the Korean Peninsula. Fifth, I say stay close to your allies, especially the, the United States. Without a close relationship with America, South Korea's existence as a free and democratic society would be at real risk from the North and from China. So do not take the United States for granted. The desire of the American people to lessen their global burdens is very real. And if the wrong signals were sent, the Republic of Korea could find itself vulnerable. Sixth, I say, do not forget your many other friends in the world. The Republic of Korea is admired as one of the most successful countries in modern history. It's a model democracy, a desirable economic partner, and a positive contributor to global affairs. That's how the government I led in Canada saw the Republic of Korea and why we deepened our relationship with the successful negotiation of a free trade agreement with President Park's administration in 2014. But among your potentially even greater friends is one of your neighbors, the state of Japan. As terrible as the history between your countries has been, seek reconciliation with the Japanese, which I know has long been a Universal Peace Federation priority. The Japanese and Korean peoples have much in common today and will have even more in common in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, once again, I just wanna thank this organization, the Universal Peace Federation, Dr. Moon and all your senior leadership for all that you do to further this noble cause and for inviting me again today. I'm optimistic that I'll see many of you in a couple of weeks in Seoul, the first time that, this, that that's been possible since the pandemic broke out. In the meantime, I look forward to the rest of our session. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Harper. I really appreciated your comments about uh, the Republic of Korea's reputation in the world and the fact that it has many, many friends and, and admirers. And this ultimately is, I think, forms part of its sort of broader security uh, network. Um, today, right now, I'd like to turn to Mr. Bondovic to, uh, for, for his remarks and uh, look forward to uh, what he has to say about what are the prospects of dealing with this tough issue. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Excellencies, uh, dear participants around the world. I uh, add my voice to my, what my colleague, uh, Mr. Harper now said that it's um, uh, a danger that uh, the Korean challenge uh, will be forgotten in, uh, in the world dominated by other conflicts of today. So thank you also to the organizer for making this uh, uh, event so we can remind about uh, the importance of going on to try to find a peaceful uh, solution on the Korean conflict and the reunification on the peninsula. As a background for my uh, approach, I uh, will just remind uh, ourselves that the people of the Korean peninsula has during history suffered under occupation and wars, and they really disturb peace and independence. After the withdrawal of the military troops from US and from Soviet in 1949, the leaders both in North and in South stated that they wanted a united Korea, but under their own political system. Thereafter, we had the Korean War from 50 to 53, a big tragedy for so many. And as we know, the political systems in North and South are so different 
that it will be a huge challenge, if possible at all, to build a bridge between them. I saw with my own eyes this fact, the great differences between North and South, when I visited both countries in the middle of the 1990s as a member of a parliamentarian delegation from Norway. And the gap between North and South has only increased in the years after. But still a reunification should be the ultimate goal. It seemed also uh, to be impossible to unite East and West Germany, but they succeeded. And it should be possible also uh, on the Korean Peninsula. And we know that initiatives have been taken to bring the parties together in order to create conditions for cooperation and a possible later reunification. I was personally especially inspired by late President Kim Dae-yong, with whom I became a friend. And I was inspired by his uh, sunshine uh, policy. And we know that uh, in June 2000, Kim Dae-yong met North Korea, Korea's leader at that time, Kim Jong-il, in Pyongyang. The tensions were calmed down and follow-up meetings were organized. And some limited cooperation took place within areas as economy, industry, and tourism. And a new summit took place in 2007, now between President Ro Mohuin in South and Kim Jong-il in North. But thereafter, the policy of South Korea and the US changed to some extent, and they introduced sanctions on North Korea who on their side canceled all previous agreements between North and South that should reduce the conflicts on the peninsula. Tensions increased and we experienced new conflicts and, uh, uh, between them. In 2007 and 18, things changed. Some talks took place during the Winter Olympics in, nine, in 2018 in South that paved the way for a summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un later the same year. But these meetings did not seem to be enough prepared and coordinated on the US side and no real outcome was achieved. Consequently, there is a need of new initiatives, and they have to be prepared and broadly anchored. And they should have an approach of a step-by-step -step development. In addition to the two Korean state, it is obvious that US especially, but also China, Russia, and Japan must play a role. In other words, the participants in the six party talks. The nuclear issue is, of course, crucial. But I'm not sure that this should be the starting point for new talks, because it could be a non-starter. I believe more in an approach by starting with confidence-building measures, as late President Kim Dae-yong uh, did. And as we know, such measures was where in his time, family reunification events. And I remember my, I had the uh, honor of participating in the first family reunification event in Seoul in 2000. I will never forget it. It really uh, moved me. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, the human links between North and South are the strongest links, more than economy and others. And secondly, we know under Kim Dae-yong that uh, it was established the industry park on the northern side of the um, border and with investments from south. We know that it was built railway and road across the border. And it was opened the route uh, to a um, famous tourist spot in north. 
these both concrete results of the sunshine policy, later very much changed. New initiative require political courage and international engagement. We know that North Korea, first of all, wants a dialogue with the United States. And maybe the last, uh, the recent uh, testing uh, is in a way a signal that North Korea want the dialogue, they want to come out of their isol isolation. So I do hope that the current president and administration in Washington will seriously consider taking new initiatives in full understanding, of course, with the president gov and government in South Korea, and gradually also bring in other important partners on board. And to do better preparations for the process and for what they want to achieve than we experienced under the previous US president having talks with the leader in, uh, in North. So I welcome this uh, opportunity to discuss what can be done in order to promote a peaceful reunification on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bondeville. I think you made some very important points, including what the architecture and structure of any future talks should be. I personally cannot imagine a solution that does not in some configuration or, or other bring uh, China and Russia somehow to the table. They're both uh, direct neighbors of North Korea. They have security interests. And I think uh, it would, it's important to have some kind of six party talks. Obviously uh, the inability of the six party talks to succeed in, in uh, in addressing this issue is kind of given way to the view that somehow there's something wrong with the structure uh, and that therefore somehow this ought to be done more bilaterally. Hard to say, but I think it's clearly an issue that involves more than just the United States or the ROK. It involves these other countries, including Japan, of course. So there's a logic to the six party talks that I think is often missed in the politics of it. But I think that logic really should uh, should play a role. I mean, I cannot imagine a solution which China is not a somehow participant or full participant because it has it has an interest in what is to become of North Korea. So I thought very imp important remarks. And now to finish, uh, to have our third uh, and last presenter before we go to the uh, to our panelists, uh, I'd like ask, to ask President Carmona to offer his thoughts on the issue. Uh, President Carmona, I think you uh, you need to unmute yourself there. We've all been automatically muted, so you have to unmute. Uh, are you hearing me now? Yes. Okay. Distinguished presenters, panelists, and moderators, ladies and gentlemen. There is international consensus that the undeclared state of war subsisting between the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, North Korea, and the Republic of Korea, South Korea, must be brought to an end. This unconditional cessation of hostility in the Korean Peninsula would give added traction to goal number 16 of the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, peace, justice, and strong institutions. Bringing North and South Korea to the table of peace requires international mobilization through advocacy and genuine global cooperation and collaboration. What is required is forward thinking, not revisiting the painful past, but coming to terms with the intergenerational and intragenerational hopes and ambition for united Korean people. A united Korea must adhere to a governance structure that recognizes and respects human rights, the rule of law, due process, and the rules of natural justice. A public survey conducted by Carnegie Endowment for International Peace Asia program saw that the majority of South Koreans felt the need for unified Korea but one that continues to have alliances with the US and China. There is a sense, however, that the Korean people want to be, and I quote, friends of many and satellite of none. And the superpowers must respect this. 
much was anticipated in July 2021 when the North and South Korean leaders exchanged diplomatic letters agreeing to restore relations after a significant hiatus arising out of an incident at an inter-Korean laser officer funded by South Korea. Pyongyang state media stated, and I quote, they both agreed to make a big stride in recovering their mutual trust, end of quote. Hope bloomed when the South Korean military promised to resume communication with the northern forces twice a day at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m., including giving details about illegal fishing in the Yellow Sea. Thereafter, there was a break in these anticipated modalities. Global support and collaboration by the international community, especially US, China, and Japan, to revisit what was agreed upon back then will go a long way to easing tensions in the peninsula. This is against the backdrop that Korean reunification and inter-Korean relations must not be perceived as being at the behest of foreign influence and intervention, but rather emanating from the altruistic and pragmatic hopes of the Korean people themselves. The Security Council must lead and not be a repository of gamesmanship and hegemonic footworks and aspirations. A case in point is what transpired at the Security Council's closed door meeting last week. The US was advocating sanctions against individuals connected to the recent North Korean tactical guided missile launches and its program. And Russia and China raised the issue of the efficacy of sanctions and whether the intended purpose was being achieved. The Chinese foreign ministry spokesman Zhao Lihan stated, and I quote, facts have proven time and time again that blindly resorting to sanctions and pressure would only escalate the tensions further rather than settle the Korean Peninsula issue. This meets no party's interest, end of quote. In a joint statement on same, eight United Nations Security Council members stated, and I quote, the launches demonstrate the regime's determination to pursue weapons of mass destruction and ballistic programs at all costs, including the, at the expense of, expense of its own people, end of quote. These opposing positions do have efficacy, even merit and represent legitimate concerns, but it has resulted in a type of Mexican standoff, which does not lend itself to facilitating genuine global collaborative efforts for a United Korean Peninsula. The present framework, an environment for solution-oriented discussions in the, security, in the Security Council are simply not there, not working, not facilitatory enough in the context of mediation and alternative dispute resolutions in order to affirmatively address the world's problems. What of their ultimate mandate for peace and security? The issue of enlisting global cooperation for the reunification of the Korean Peninsula must be triggered in a holistic way at the level of the Security Council and the United Nations in New York. They must lead and not be dictated by herd interests and backward politics that are divisive and must be corralled by the common good attainable through a united Korea. In January 2022, North Korea has engaged in the launching of several missiles, including a nuclear-capable hypersonic glide missile. In the light of this, the Treaty of Tataloko offers a solution. It founded the Organization for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in Latin America and the Caribbean, OPANA, establishing Latin America and the Caribbean as a nuclear weapons free zone. This roadmap can trigger action to achieve the universalization of the Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty, which eliminates the production and use of nuclear weapons. Additionally, urgent attention must be given to the adherence and and the widespread implementation of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, the CTBT, signed by 185 countries and ratified by 170. This treaty prohibits nuclear weapon tests or explosions, and its implementation must be zealously invoked by all global partners. The Caribbean, as a zone of peace, can facilitate future peaceful negotiations of the Korean Peninsula. The economics of, of peace will support a culture of peace. The reopening of the Kaesong Industrial Complex, given the economic ravages of the COVID-19 pandemic, will mutually benefit North and South Korea, providing a sustainable economic environment. It on, its undeniable efficacy will provide Korean companies with cheaper labor costs, bringing Forex to North Korea and reforming its economy. 
It is the peace economy, and as South Korean President Moon Jae-in has stated, and I quote, the peace economy would dismantle the last remaining Cold War regime on Earth and build a new order of peace and prosperity, end of quote. Finally, an inspirational historical incentive is the present celebration of 31 years of German reunification, one that lost upon the Politburo of South Korea as a lesson learned and a success achieved and admired. President Moon Jae-in had his unification minister, Lee In-young, engage in a symbolic pilgrimage to Germany to examine and learn from the strategic mechanisms employed that triggered German unity. And it remains a telling statement that his government is committed to a unified Korean Peninsula. As much as the German reunification model is not an ideal match or panacea for Korean unity, it speaks to what is both possible and achievable in the peninsula. Finally, I wish to congratulate the Universal Peace for the Federation, Dr. Moon, and of course, in fact, Dr. Yam, for the excellent work in bringing all these experts together in the hope of creating further progressive advocacy for the reunification and the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Carmona, for uh, a couple of very important points. One is to you know, remind us all that there are uh, arms control agreements worldwide that we all have responsibilities uh, to, uh, to maintain. And, uh, this is, uh, there's not just some North Korean exceptionalism. There are a lot of issues out there in the world, a lot of international agreements out there in the world. And I think you also make a very valuable point in talking about some of the models that do exist. Uh, we all know that um, the Korean Peninsula is not Germany, but uh, certainly there were uh, mechanisms, as you point out, in, the, in German unification that should be studied and, and are being studied as, as Korea considers what its future might look like. So a lot to think about, and I thank you very much for your contribution. So now I think we will go to our, our panelists and we will start with uh, uh, Doug Bondo, who will uh, uh, perhaps um, give some thoughts on uh, how he sees the, uh, these presentations. Doug, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador Hill. It's a great pleasure to join everyone on this panel. It's a, a good time to be discussing peacemaking and uh, bringing countries together as we look around the world. We see great cause for concern in many regions and the need of an organization like the Universal Peace Federation to be active and find ways to try to reduce conflict and tensions among uh, very different peoples around the world. And the Korean Peninsula has long been a focus of, of those kinds of issues. Uh, the uh, South Korea is in the midst of a rather bitter uh, presidential election. They will be having to come together after that election in March. It'll be very important for them to be able to unify and to, to work together. And as has been noted earlier, North Korea has shot off seven missiles uh, last month, uh, quite a start to the year. And uh, you know, where that is leading, no one is quite sure. It shows the issues that uh, we have to deal with. And it's, I think, important to realize that as we deal with the tensions uh, that we face today, uh, that uh, you know, these will help prepare for reunification tomorrow. That there's both a short and a long-term issue here at stake. And it's very critical to focus on these short-term issues that can help lead to longer-term you know, solutions. To have reunification is going to require uh, <clears throat> support from other states, uh, very important across the region. And trying to bring these states together despite very different views is going to be a great challenge, I believe. And we're going to want these states to work together both on the short and the long-term. Uh, one set of countries, very different, will be the allies that, that have security interests. We think of both the United States and China. You know, we think of you know, other uh, you know, issues, the uh, issues of uh, you know, countries that are close by with significant interests, you know, Russia and Japan, that we think of uh, trading partners, you know, a a region that's filled with countries that deal with, uh, you know, especially South Korea, but also North Korea, that are close by in Asia, but well beyond the Asian region. We also look at international organizations, the role of the United Nations, World Bank, and others that are going to be effective. And how to bring these organizations and countries together bilaterally, regionally, 
you know, the six party talks were mentioned as a possible model or probably relying on both short, uh, you know, both bilateral and regional. Then we think of the tools to be used, general support and encouragement, especially with suspicion that some countries might not be supportive of uh, reunification. I think it's important for countries like Japan and China to be very clear that they do support these issues, what the uh, Korean people want. How to adjust relations, this is, will be a real challenge for whether it's allies, trading partners and others to bring North and South together changes how things work. The, uh, and the question of issues or ideas for moving forward on reunification. It's hard to think of a more difficult process than to bring together a capitalist and uh, you know, democratic South and, and a very different system in the North. Hard to imagine you know, together in one fell swoop, as uh, you know, Stephen Harper mentioned, the idea that North Korea, the presumption is, would disappear. On my first visit 30 years ago, which is hard to believe, I had North Koreans worried about being swallowed. And I think that fear remains. Issues of uh, you know, federalism, of uh, you know, finding ways to perhaps change the process over time. Uh, how do we deal with challenges and troubles? And trust will need to be you know, built. So ultimately, reunification will be up to the Korean people, both sides of the DMZ. You know, the Korean people need to know that they will be supported, whatever they decide and however they proceed. And that support needs to be shown uh, today and in the future, working on today's problems as well as the challenges for the future. It uh, is going to be an extraordinary task, but the hope is that we can build for a better future. And if Korea can do this, if we can find Koreans, you know, can come together and build a reunified society, that could be a model around the world of how peoples can jump beyond extraordinary divisions and differences and problems and history that these two countries have. And I think that is the challenge for the future. And I've been asked to uh, you know, present a query for our earlier panel. And uh, I, I'm thinking of Stephen Harper as he was prime minister of a country that faces its own challenges and divisions within. And uh, you know, that was not all, always easy, I think, for him or others who hold the post of prime minister. And if he has thoughts on how to try to deal with and can encourage countries in Northeast Asia to work together given the different interests. He noted the problems of say, say a Russia, or that may have been Ambassador Hill, I, I think it was I think it was Mr. Harper, that, uh, you know, but it's hard to have reunification without dealing with Russia. So how does one deal with the process of China and the US, of Japan and Russia? Does he have any thoughts perhaps on how to do that? And I thank you again for the opportunity to contribute. Yeah, thank thanks. Uh, thanks, Doug. Just. Um, very quickly, I, I'm, I'm not sure how much the Canadian experience could shed on this. It's, it's true that Canada is a large and complex country, and we've had separation movements and national unity divisions. Um, but, you know, we've always managed to deal with those tensions through essentially an internal democratic system. And in our history, you know, we've had two countries, um, you know, Britain earlier and certainly the United States in the modern era that uh, are really the only other possible players and they've been supportive of Canada as a unified country. So we haven't had, we, we haven't had uh, any external forces, um, uh, you know, meddling in, a, in an unhelpful way, nor, nor have we had, you know, armed camps. These are, you know, these are democratic political divisions we have in our country. Um, in the case of, I, I guess what I would say in the case of, of uh, the Koreas, um, look, I, I, I think it's such an extraordinary difficult, extraordinarily difficult situation because I, as I said earlier, I think the reality is, and I know a lot of people don't want to hear it, the reality is that um, North Korea can only survive by maintaining a state of war. Um, the day there is peace, uh, the North Korean people will not want to maintain a separate state. Um, and that's a serious problem for the regime. Um, look, there's been all kinds of ways of trying to manage this. Sunshine policy, six party talks, more hawkish approaches, the President Trump initiative, and they've all had the same result, which has been 
Um, regardless of whether tensions have seemed to increase or decrease, North Korea has continued inexorably to build its military and weapons capacities, and that is likely to continue. But look, as I say, I think as long as the South and the Allies don't let their guard down, there's never any harm in engagement. And particularly, I would say, engagement where you can engage people. Um, you know, things like the family reunification efforts that, or, or meetings that have periodically happened, even the, um, the, uh, the, some of the joint Olympic exercises back in 2018. I think these things are fundamentally helpful. And I would say they're, they're probably the one parallel, Doug, that I would draw to Canada, um, where, you know, often it's, it's actually interaction between ordinary people that, that kind of undermines um, the, the, the kind of more difficult political debates. Um, you know, once, once people understand each other and are not threatened by each other, um, those kinds of more political or ideological difficulties uh, become less, uh, less important. And so I think that's our best hope here. Our best hope is to engage to the extent we can, as long as our guard is up, try and uh, get um, ordinary people uh, across the border to meet, to engage with each other, to know each other, and hope that someday, as we saw in East Germany and as we've seen in other parts of the world, that someday the, the leadership of North Korea just wakes up, and we've seen this happen, just wakes up and realizes that it's living a pointless existence of stagnation and repression. And there, you know, who wants to live without hope and progress? Um, and, you know, my view is, I say, if we do these things, that eventually that day will come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, both Doug and, uh, and uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Those are excellent, excellent thoughts. I was wondering how you would answer, answer the question of whether Canada has some uh, uh, secret formula in terms of its own internal problems that I kind of suspected they're a little different with uh, uh, the Koreas, but uh, thank you for, for laying all that out. Yeah, we, we have no Kim Jong-un in Canada. <laughs> no, you, you sure don't. <laughs> Uh, now I'd like to turn to uh, uh, Mr. Nasrallah, Vice President of Honduras, for, uh, for his comments on the presenters and for comments generally. Mr. Nasrallah? Buenos dias. Good morning, everyone. Uh, there is a business issue, not only for the, the big uh, powers, they need to involve in the reunification of both Koreas, not only the great powers. I believe to, to uh, consider the human reality, we need that other nations closer to those two Koreas take part because the needs are completely different. And the objectives of the nations not that big are quite different. I hope the UPF, I really thank UPF for inviting us to these kinds of big, so, such important meetings. We try to make a, a meeting in where we can all get all together the treaties that we are that have been signed already between the great nations, great powers, and they are not being accomplished because many people, the people in the streets, in it's believing lesser in those agreements because nobody follows them. And the problems persist. So we need to review all those signed agreements we will be doing a very strong step ahead. We, I consider the uh, export events in all kinds of disciplines like the Olympics, for example, uh, soccer games, I remember. When the United States went to play to Iran in several uh, sports, those countries that are 
when they have faced it, they uh, get closer when they play sports, when they face each other like a, a sport team, sport uh, groups, sport games. So this is uh, sports are the games that uh, make people to forget the things that happen in the nations. And then and they, a small nation like they, our Honduras, we have been elected as vice president of Honduras as a, as a small is Trinidad and Tobago is also small nation, our nations uh, for its reality in, in economical reality, we are very different. And because of the human situation, the inhabitants, I think we have more close to closeness to the people of North Korea than South Korea. And so we can find ways, we can show ways how to offer some ways to, to make a, a, this encounter with those two nations. So we, uh, pro I propose that we review all those treaties and also we as not so powerful nation, we can provide some kind of sportive events that can bring peace to the world in a model to solution. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Nasrallah. I think uh, it's an important contribution to think in terms of what other countries who may not kind of set the market politically or even economically in a certain region, how they can perhaps give North Korea some sense that it, they can work out things with their neighbors. They do not need to develop nuclear weapons. And in fact, they can uh, uh, be a model for North Korea to begin to come out of its, uh, of its isolation. Needless to say, there are enormous differences uh, in the people and the political systems, but very good contribution. So thank you very much. And now I'd like to go to our last panelist, uh, last but not least, Mr. Niklas uh, Swanstrom, Executive Director of the Institute of Security and Development Policy in Stockholm to give his thoughts. So we are, he will be the last uh, speaker. I don't think we're gonna have much time for further consultation, further uh, discussion, but let me turn it over to Mr. Swanstrom at this time. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate uh, the organizer of this event as everybody else. Um, I'm going to be slightly pessimistic as well. I mean, reunification, I think, is very difficult. I mean, many of the reasons has been mentioned. In my discussion with my North Korean colleagues, they're very explicit. And even today that um, the German experience was not a good one. It's a liberal economy swallowing maybe not so successful economy. And let's be honest, the East German economy was actually quite decent compared to the North Korean economy. Um, so the question is, you know, how do we overcome this? And um, I think this really is a, we need to look at a version of the Helsinki process uh, where we have different baskets coming in and we can work with different um, issues. Uh, process which I actually have sort of dubbed Arirang process to give it a bit of Korean touch, uh, where we can work on confidence building, we can work on economy, we can work on aid, denuclearization, etc. And when we can't move forward on one issue, we can try to move into the next issue. The problem, of course, is that the North Koreans don't like this <laughs> because they realized the Soviet Union fell there was undermined very much through the Helsinki process. So the question is, of course, how do we manage to convince the North Koreans to engage? And, and the reality is it's security. It's security for the North Korean regime. It's security for sort of military security. And I think we many times sort of underestimate the North Korean willingness to remain an independent state. Uh, there's a, I think, misconception that they're willing to reduce the nuclear weapons, et cetera, for financial gains. I, I simply don't think that's reality. I think it is a security concern. So I think what we need to build is a process that really takes a bit of more departure in what the North Koreans 
seems to be concerned about. That do not mean, I think we should lift sanctions. It doesn't mean we should give concessions to North Korea. It means that we should try to lift the questions they think is important. I think the sanctions need to remain simply because they're there for a reason. That's the nuclear, the development of nuclear weapons. But at the same time, trying to still bring in the North Korean angle in this. And I think the North Koreans are willing to do that. We have quite a lot of North Koreans visiting an ISTP, my own institution. And my impression is they're very much engagement, engagement oriented and they know the reality. So I think there's very good reasons to have a dialogue. To the Honorable uh, Mr. Bundevik, I, I would like to turn a question to, to, to you that I get a lot. I get it about Sweden, and I would like to ask the same question about Norway. What do you think Norway's role could be in a, what I would see, process for peaceful engagement? I'm not entirely convinced of unification, but uh, we always get... There's a bit of uh, either Sweden or Norway that is going to try to engage the North Koreans. What do you think is strength of Norway? What can Norway offer the, the peace process? And I know you have a lot of experience in this, so I would be very interested in hearing what you think, you know, a neutral nation, at least within brackets, uh, neutral, uh, as Norway could uh, could do on the uh, Korean Peninsula. And I'll stop there. Mr. Vandevik, the floor is yours to answer that. Thank you. I will uh, respond to Mr. Swanstrom's question. But just before doing that, and also as a background for my answer, I will say that it is, of course, difficult today to know what common people in North Korea really mean. Um, it was um, stated that um, you know, the willingness of North to be an independent state is maybe stronger than we um, think. But that is a leadership. I do agree that the leadership of North, they, I think, want to remain as an independent state. But I'm not sure that common people in North mean that. But we don't know um, because of, of obvious reasons, because they are isolated. They cannot express their opinions. Um, we got some indications that when you have the, reun uh, the family reunification events, and as I said, I had the pleasure of, uh, of attending the first reunification event in Seoul in the year 2000, and it was, I will never forget it. It was so moving. People still feel that that there is one nation. They are one people. It's not North Koreans and South Koreans, it is Koreans. And I, I still believe that this is a feeling among common people in North. But of course they now get newer, uh, younger generations and they are, have not, are not used to live in one country. They are used to live in uh, these two divided states. And maybe they have other thoughts than their parents and grandparents. We don't know exactly. So that is one uncertainty. But I still I believe that there is a, a strong feeling of being one nation, one people. Um, I do believe, as I said, and that is also uh, the experience from Norwegian uh, contributions to peace in other parts of the world, that confidence building measures is, they are crucial because there is a lack of confidence between North and South and the leadership in North and South today, completely a lack of, of confidence. Uh, so we have to address uh, what they're also thinking about in the North. And it was mentioned by Svanström, I think security. We have to address, address their wish of security. Uh, I do believe also in other more, let's just say, soft uh, confidence building measures. It was from our friend in Honduras mentioned sport as an eager uh, soccer supporter. I do believe that sport can be used as well, as we saw under the Winter Olympics in South, uh, bringing people together from North and South in sport, soccer and other sports. Um, 
the Norwegian experience, I, I, in my view, our most successful uh, contribution for peace is in uh, the Latin American countries, Guatemala. I remember it very well. I was Minister of Foreign Affairs when this process started. It lasted for six years. And, and so they signed uh, the agreement, I think, in 1996. Uh, and it still works, uh, despite uh, turbulence and problems. And what was the main reason behind? It was an, a Norwegian non-governmental organization, a Norwegian church aid at this case, in this case, that had been working on uh, areas controlled by both the government and the guerrilla in Guatemala for many years. They had access to the leaders on both sides, to the government, to the guerrilla leaders, and they built up a confidence. And gradually they could bring the parties together by help of um, the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs, which where I was a minister, of foreign, uh, minister at that time, uh, back in 1990. So I, to start on the grassroots level, confidence building measures is the key. But of course, it's not easy to start on the grassroots level in North uh, because uh, non-governmental organizations uh, don't have access normally. There are some working there, but very few, and sometimes they are expelled uh, from the North uh, and they don't get access with the humanitarian aid. That is one of the catastrophes in the North. People have suffered, people have died because of that. So Norway's contribution, as Mr. Swanstrom asked about, well, I think that if there's anything Norway can do to introduce confidence building measures, primarily on the grassroots level, maybe through non-governmental organizations that could have access also into the North, that will be the main uh, a main contribution, I think, from uh, Norway's side. Because we know that on the more political level, with regard to concrete negotiations, other countries will play a more important role in this regard, especially the, the, the countries within um, the six parties uh, talks. And maybe at one point I disagree a little bit with my colleague, Mr. Harper, who said, let not uh, Putin's Russia play an important role. Well. I do agree. It's, it's very much to say about uh, Mr. Putin and how he's acting today, also in Europe, with regard to Ukraine. But like it or not, Russia is a neighbor and Russia has to be taken on board sooner or later if it should be a successful process for reunification. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very, very interesting. I will note as someone who represented the U.S. side in six party talks, which was often quite difficult to get five parties to agree on how to address the North Korean issue. Uh, the Russians did tend to be constructive in it, uh, um, albeit when it came the time to kind of tell the North Koreans, this is the best deal you're gonna get. Sometimes they weren't as constructive as they, they could have been, but I, I, would, uh, I would share uh, uh, Mr. Bondovic's uh, uh, comment that, uh, frankly, we're going to need uh, need Russia somehow at the table. I would also like to put in a pitch for the U.S. being an active participant. I don't think there's any escape for the U.S. on this to uh, outsource this kind of diplomacy. I think we're, we're going to have to be very uh, active whenever uh, the time comes, and especially for for the fact that it's going to take some real patience and the, uh, the nuclear issue needs to be ensconced in a, in a broader question. Uh, uh, President Carbona, we did not hear again from you. So I'm just gonna give you the opportunity to give some uh, concluding thoughts before I turn it over to the, uh, to the, uh, to the moderators. So uh, uh, President Carbona, any thoughts from your perspective, uh, having heard the panelists and all the presenters? Oops, you have to hit that uh, pesky mute button. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I can tell you, in fact, that I'm swayed by what Vice President Nasraya has, has opined with regard to the utility and the efficacy of sport in the context of creating bonding and, and unification. Because, of course, you would all recall that in, back in 2018, 
at the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics, which is now referred to as the Peace Olympics. President Moon, in fact, took the opportunity where sport was used as a facilitator to initiate several summits between North Korea and South Korea and a summit between United States of America and, and of course, um, North Korea. Now, we have to recognize it is going to be a difficult process because when one consider, for example, financially, the economics of, of both countries, as one speaker mentioned, when you consider, for example, you're dealing with, with South Korea, the fourth largest economy in, in, in Southeast Asia, the tenth in the world, you're talking about with a GDP of $1.8 trillion. You're talking about with a, uh, a per capita income, yearly income of 47,000 US a year, as opposed to North Korea, $27.2 billion uh, GDP. And, and then of course, a per capita income of under $2,000. You know, it is going to be a, a difficult take in the context of economics, because of course, yes, Experts have estimated it'll cost South Korea $3 trillion to initiate the process of reconciliation. But it does not mean for, for, for one moment that things cannot be done in the interim. I have, I have mentioned the, the restart of the Kaesong Industrial Center uh, complex as a, as, a, as a mechanism for creating economic sustainability in the region. Because I always, have, as I've mentioned before, the economics of peace will support a culture of peace. And in this regard, it is very, it is imperative that the United States, Russia, China, recognize that, as I've stated before, that the Korean people want, they want to be friends, as I am quoting, in fact, from Prime Minister Barrow of Barbados, they want to be friends of many and satellite of none. And I think it is this, this dynamic that we need to look at. I mean. Why is there, for example, this proliferation of spending by North and South Korea in, 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 the, in the last five, six years, you know? So I, I feel in, in, in that regard that we certainly need global advocacy to be engaged in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way that, that spreads the message of peace and the benefits of a culture of peace. So again, in fact, you know, I, I, I have to thank you all for for giving me that opportunity to, to express these, 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 these words of encouragement, because I really honestly feel that things are possible. We cannot be pessimistic. And as one, in fact, speaker indicated, in the same way, for example, how the Berlin Wall fell suddenly and quickly, things can happen in North Korea to generate, in fact, the reconciliatory measures that, that need to be put in place, recognizing albeit that North Korea still feels strongly of being the, the sole legitimate power in terms of governance. But of course, in fact, we have the, the counter reality where you have 52 million people in South Korea as opposed to 26. And, 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 and there is that risk and concern, of course, with, with possible massive migration taking place if North Korea falls. You know, there, there are a lot of uh, variables and, and we have to prepare for those variables. And this is why, in fact, you know, this constant advocacy for reconciliation, de denuclearization must continue. You know, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I would like to join others and thank you. Thank you, the Universal Peace Federation for making this uh, um, just for me, fascinating panel of uh, international experts for making this all possible to get the interaction among these experts and especially to get the diversity of these experts from really all over, uh, all over the globe. So thank you very much. And with that, I will turn it back over to the conference. So. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Hill. And thank you to all the panelists, uh, Honorable Stephen Harper, uh, His Excellency Bondovic, Ex Excellency Carmona, Dr. Nicholas Swanstrom, uh, Honorable Nasrallah, and uh, last but not least, doc, uh, Dr. Bando. Uh, we should uh, remind you that our time is limited and we wish we had more time to continue this great discussion, but there are more sessions coming up 
and they're concurrent globally in Asia, in Europe, in Africa, and in the Americas, according to time zone. And there are similar sessions going on over the next three days. The next one for the Americas is in about one hour. It's the International Association of Parliamentarians for Peace. And there will be segments from the other uh, pillars of UPF taking place in the next hours. Um, with that, I'd also like to remind you that next week between February 10th and 14th, we will have the World Summit, which will be taking place in Korea in person and also virtually. Because of the pandemic, we can't have everybody here in Korea where I am at this moment. And uh, we look forward to you participating. Originally, we had hoped that this session of Think Tank 2022 and the World Summit would happen in the same time at the same place. But there are forces beyond our control that make it impossible for that to happen. So at this time, I'd like to thank you all for uh, participating today. Thank you to all our speakers, our panelists, to the 500 or so who showed up on Zoom, and to the many thousands more on YouTube and Facebook through which this has been streamed. You will be able to watch a recording. You can go to our YouTube channel and watch it later. Thank you again. May peace Thank be you. with you. Hey, have a great day or night or evening, wherever you are in the world. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.